All right, let me get into character, ready? This training sucked. We already learned all of that content last year. What a joke. That wasn't even applicable to me in my role. Another boring training video. This was pointless. By show of hands, how many of you have been personally victimized by the Regina Georgia training? Okay, now that we're all trauma bonded, time for trust falls. Just kidding. As Autumn mentioned, my name is Bria Sandoval. I'm a cyber director with KPMG and I lead our human risk management service. But more importantly today, I'm Cyber Barbie. So how do we stop comments like that? The answer is a personalized experience and that's role-based learning. So let's set the stage here and I'll get on the same page with what does that mean? What's the definition of role-based learning? And you, you'll notice I use the term learning and I consider that the umbrella corporation, so to speak, of training and awareness, they fall up underneath it. They are essentially avenues and tools in which we create learn. So we put this definition here together and essentially it's that personalized learning approach. And the goal is to get employees to understand the cyber threats and then be able to demonstrate the desired behaviors we want them to see to reduce risk and influence a desired security culture, right? That's a mouthful. So uh, in short, it's let's train the right people at the right time with the right message. Now, I'll tell you a quick story here. We'll, we'll talk about some of these benefits. A client came to me a couple years ago and they just went through a security breach. They realized it's time we need some, some training and awareness for our organization. And so we, we came in, they had that typical death by PowerPoint, you know, all the ones that we take while watching cat videos on YouTube, right? Exactly. Um, so we, we created their role-based training program for them. And I'm going to walk you guys through all of the steps that we did to get through there. And they had also, their employees were saying very similar comments of the Regina George of the company, right? Uh, for those of you who've seen Mean Girls, anybody? Raise a hand. Okay. Some of you, this will resonate with and otherwise ask me later. Um, so after we, we developed this training program for them, their attitudes completely changed. They, it was more customized, it's, you know, really hit on the day-to-day -day challenges and threats that they see in their roles. Uh, in addition to that, they also saw a reduction in the incidents that they had and an increase in the reported suspected incidents. Now, I tell you that story because it's just one example of uh, organizations that have experienced similar benefits to a role-based training program. And you can see the stats here on the slides, the, the numbers don't lie, right? You can see the increase in retention and knowledge, creating that culture of accountability, the ROI from increased productivity, uh, and the ability really to identify what those threats are and how they can actually address them. So now that we're all on the same page of the basics, let's talk about the how, that's what you're here for, right? Give me the tools that I can take back to my company and implement a role-based training program. Now, the question that we're trying to answer is, how do I figure out who needs training and what do they need it on? So we have this five-step process and I'm gonna go through each one of these with you in detail. And you can see some uh, timelines here at the bottom. Just know these are kind of the average that we see organizations experience, but it's gonna vary, of course, based on the size of your organization. It could be triple this, cut this in half, the number of resources you have, et cetera. There's numerous factors. Um, and one thing, the reason why we, we created this five-step approach is uh, I think clients usually or organizations jump straight into this construct phase right here. Let's build training. And I'm like, cool, what are you going to build it on? And they're like, we don't know. So the vision stage is super important to really set your strategy that's focused on risk. So let's jump in. The, the title here at the top and the description, I want you guys to keep in the back of your mind because this is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do, is reduce the cyber human-centric threats in high-risk roles. The challenge with role-based training and why organizations seem to think it's this huge thing that, that's very complicated 
is they think they have to train every single role within their organization. It's not true. Focus on where you're going to get the biggest bang from your buck. And in order to do that, let's talk with risks. So I recommend starting with gathering cyber intel either that you have from other external sources or work with your SOC or your CERT team to see what are the incidents that you're already experiencing, what are the risks that are documented in your enterprise risk register. Those are just different examples that you can use to build risk scenarios. And you may have anywhere between, I'd say start with five to 10 or so risk scenarios for your organization. And here's an example of one that we're gonna use throughout the entire uh, presentation here. And the first is essentially that employees would potentially compromise the uh, confidentiality of sensitive information. Once you have your risk scenario inventory, you wanna then focus on behaviors. You guys have heard a lot about behaviors already. And I think that's where the focus is going to then ch change from a training standpoint on how you actually influence those behaviors. So the behavior we want to see here is data protection. Employees protect the data in accordance with whatever your organizational policies are. So then, and, and behavior-wise, I'd say go with three to five or so to start with. You don't want to overwhelm yourself with them because then you got to collect all the data and metrics to be able to evaluate those behaviors, which we'll get into. Now, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about a tool that we use called Personas. Essentially, they are a group of people that have a lot of things in common. We'll get into the details, of course. But you can see here we've identified four potential persona groups that we want to target for role-based training. And based on the risks that we see and the behaviors that we're trying to influence, we're then going to go through that data, analyze it, and then prioritize what the roles are we want to start with. So for this example, we are going to start with research and development. And a persona profile, as I mentioned, is that you know, common group of individuals. This can be done on a variety of levels. You can do it at a business unit level. You can do it even just as high as front office, back office, if you have retail locations. Um, what I would recommend here to stay away from is going too far down into like the role levels. Unless you have executives, they're a different breed, as we know. Um, so I think the important part here is when you build your persona profiles and your persona groups, think about scalability, because each one you build and a role-based curriculum around it, it needs to be tailored enough for them to get a benefit out of it and change the behaviors, but not so detailed. You're doing hundreds and hundreds of uh, persona profiles and training. It's just not going to work. So let's get into an example. Um, those who have seen Mean Girls, uh, we're going to use Gretchen, not Wiener, Gretchen Wang, as a reference. Paramount Pictures didn't approve my uh, use of Mean Girls. We'll just leave it at that. Ask me at happy hour. So <laughs> Gretchen here, if you don't know her, you're about to. She is uh, a member of the Plastics, which is a popular group, clique of girls in high school. And her father is the inventor of toaster strudel. So naturally, she's in the R&D department. And she always says, if you don't take your security training, you can't sit with us. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about how we came to the termination that Gretchen, who's a representation of the toaster strudel R&D persona, is the highest risk role we want to focus on. Well, we know because she, her father, is the inventor of toast strudel. She's got privileged access to strudel recipes. And she's an heiress, obviously, she's gonna have a high signature authority. That may be folks in your organization, like your finance department, your executives, maybe even an admin. And we know she's got elite social status. So she's going to be a high value target to attackers. Think about your executives, think about your administrators that may have privileged access. And she definitely can't keep a secret. So before we go to the next one, the way we put this persona profile together is a combination of the lovely survey and more importantly, focus groups. And we try to keep these as intimate as possible. And we do it based on the, not the voluntold method, it's all volunteer. And it's anywhere between three to five uh, members that are a representation of this particular persona group. 
And it's usually kept, it's not recorded, it's all anonymous, it's like a safe space. We build some ground rules and we ask them first, not about, we don't even talk about cyber. What does a day in the life of Gretchen Wang look like? What do you do? Where do you interact with her? The people, what kind of data do you deal with? What are some of the challenges you face? What are your goals and metrics that you, you have to meet? And then we start talking about the cyber things. And, and that really helps us get an idea of what the cyber risks are. Because if you just walk in and you're like, Gretchen, tell me about the cyber risk you see in your organization. And she's like, I work in research and development. I look at total strudel, strudel all day. Like, I don't know what that is. So that helps us build this profile around them. And some common things that we, we typically collect in this process is, you know, what is she thinking? Um, and for this example here, she thinks she, she actually checked that uh, recipient before she sent the email. And she obviously wears pink on Wednesday. Don't tell her it's Thursday and I'm wearing pink. Um, and she feels like the data protection uh, policy is confusing. So, so this gives us information that, it, you know, maybe her actions are unintentional and that we can, you know, tailor some of our training and awareness content to be a little bit clearer on the policies and breaking it down uh, for, for this persona. And in addition, some other things you can gather are, what is the cyber aptitude of this group? How do we need to talk and communicate with them? We are developing content. If they have obviously a very low aptitude here, we need to talk to them a bit differently than we would someone who's more technical. And then influence. This is a big one and can tie into your ambassador program, influencers, whatever you, you know, which flavor you want to call it here. Because of Gretchen's uh, elite status, she is an influencer within the organization. She is able to, um, you know, help spread your message and help others, excuse me, change their behaviors. And the last two pieces here that we, we try to collect are around motivational drivers and communication preferences. So with motivation, this is gonna tie back into your rewards and recognition strategy on how to best incentivize different groups. Look, the t-shirts, the, the, t the, the coffee method, coffee cup methods, the stress ball swag, doesn't work for everybody. And not everybody's you know, motivated by monetary value either. Um, you can see here for this example that Gretchen, she loves a good compliment, public praise. That, that's her gold star. That's her love language, right? And so you want to think about that when you build out your strategy on how you're going to try to motivate individuals to actually take the training or engage in awareness activities. And communications, of course, uh, I find this organizations have the biggest challenge with this because there's so many different communication vehicles, and nowadays we're all desensitized by, you know, smartphones and the 120 million emails you get in your inbox every day. So you need to really make sure you understand what are the technology platforms or vehicles that you can get information to and through that are going to be most effective. Okay, we've got our profile. Now we're ready to get into the construct phase where we're going to actually create our strategy to create content. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you an example of what cyber competencies and learning objectives and outcomes are. If you have a background in instructional design, this is really important because it sets the stage of what the actual content is that you're gonna build. Now you've got three options here. You can build it, you can buy it, or you can modify it. If you build it, you in, in either one of these three, you still need to use the competencies and learning objectives. So we start there. So if you build it, you know you're going to go through your normal stages of developing the content um, or developing the curriculum, excuse me, which I'm going to show you an example of, and creating the learning content. Buying it, I want to, you know, make sure that you guys understand the difference between buying something that's off the shelf. And a vendor says, yes, you, you can tailor this, not just putting your logo on it and changing a couple words. So when you're looking to buy role-based training from a vendor, it really does need to be customized to the role that you're looking to train on. And so I would just, you know, encourage that when you are looking for those types of things that you're looking for vendors in those you know, categories versus just something off the shelf solution. 
and then modify, which I like to call the Frankenstein method, which is basically what it sounds like. You're taking something you already have and you're building something, cutting it, clicking it together and she ain't pretty, but she gets the job done. All right, let's go back to Gretchen. We are ready now. We've got our competencies. We've got our learning outcomes and our learning objectives that we're about to create from referencing back to what our risk scenario is. She's disclosing toaster strudel recipes and we want her to protect the data. So the two competencies we would like Gretchen to obtain from this training and take away are information assurance and incident management. Now, you can use uh, what we use here, at least, is a model from NIST. It's called the NICE model. They actually have, it's free. You can go out um, and get it off the internet. It gives you a list of the competencies, the knowledge, the skills, and abilities for particular roles in an organization. Now, it is a bit um, technical and cyber focused, so you're not going to have folks like probably in the R&D department um, or in like an executive capacity. So we, we definitely leverage that as a baseline, but we tweak it uh, based on our organization's needs. So just kind of food for thought there, but that's where those competencies come from. And then the curriculum side of things, all of this ties back to what we learned from the persona profile. And the curriculum you can see here is built upon the cyber risk that we, we learned whether that's the importance of protecting the confidentiality of those strudel recipes, and then the recognition of the need to escalate and report the incident once she's inadvertently done it. And the outcomes are really the actions that we want Gretchen to take after uh, she uh, has taken the training, not just the objective side. The last two parts that I'll kind of hit on, and you can see at the top, are the seat time, micro learning, really important. No one wants to sit through, you know, an hour long training anymore. Um, and delivery method is also important here. You can if, refer back to the persona profile we were just looking at. She would prefer to be communicated with in a plastics meeting. So you can see how we've pulled all of the different components together from the persona profile into your actual content uh, strategy and created a course curriculum. Okay, we're still not ready to uh, deploy the training yet. You have to create a plan. In your strategy, you wanna make sure you have a balance of communications and not just to the end user, to leadership, to other groups that may have a training going on at that time. And make sure you're always going back to what their communication profile or preferences look like. Metrics. <laughs> Big topic, I could probably spend an hour long, if not longer, just on metrics. So I'm gonna keep this short and sweet, but please find me after this if you wanna talk more. Metrics are really important to define up front before you launch anything. You need to establish a baseline that you're gonna measure from. For this example, the behavior we're looking at is protecting data. So the metrics, the type of metrics that you wanna look at are DLP violations, use of information, classification labels, uh, whether they use them correctly or not. And through that process, you'll have to go through and, and reach out to those different data stewards and data owners and gather the, the data and see what even exists today, and then be ready to track and trend those metrics over time once you launch your campaign, which is the next step. So you've got your plan, you're launching it, it's going out, you've sent those communications to the right people, everybody's bought in, you're incentivizing, we know that Gretchen's love language is public praise, so we're, so we're saying, great job, you completed your training, whatever that may be, and you're measuring it and reporting on it throughout the process. So this is very important as you're looking at the different data that's coming back, it's not just the did Gretchen complete her training, check the box exercise compliance? It's, it's not just that, it's more, it's those metrics that we talked about before that you wanna gather. And the reporting's really important here because I find that organizations almost report too much into the wrong levels. So it's, it's important to understand who is your audience 
that you're communicating these metrics and reporting up to? And how are you telling the story with it? I think, you know, one example here is for, for this um, one in particular is the metric of um, data protection and then DLP violations. Okay, DLP violations, are they up? Are they down? Doesn't tell me anything, right? So it's bringing the data together and talking about how the behavior and trend has changed after you've released it versus before and the different things that you know, behavioral change and even culture change that you've seen over time. And with anything, you need to optimize your model. So based on what you've learned from your metrics, you want to take sure, make sure, excuse me, that you're integrating that within your future strategy. Uh, the other thing I'll say about personas is that they're living and breathing or organic, and they're based off of a certain point in time. So as your organization changes, or the cyber threat landscape changes, you need to make sure you're going back to those profiles and updating them because they're based, you're using those as a tool for everything else that's gonna come after that. So with your training content could be potentially outdated because you're training on threats that are no longer relevant. Another consideration here is if your cyber tech team or your IT team has uh, released a tool that completely like DLP wise is, let, let's say they completely blocked any kind of external data from your certain organization, then you don't need to focus on that behavior anymore because a piece of technology has removed the human element from it. So those are other considerations to think of as you have launched your training and you're considering, you know, next year, which personas to focus on it is looking at your organization as a whole on what those cyber risks are. Is anybody else's brain melting or is it just me? It's the lights. Okay, so um, that was a lot of steps to go through. I'm gonna give you some tips here on things that you can do before you even start to get to those steps. They're essentially what we call in the consulting world is accelerators. It'll help you gather information and insight so that way you can hit the ground running. So the first thing, I suggest is socialize the importance. You can use that slide that that's in here. I, I'm pretty sure they're sending the slides out. Is that right, Lance? Yeah, okay. So the metric slide that I showed, use that and any other data points that you have to express the, the what's in it for me, the importance, the value and the benefits to your leadership team. Get support and buy-in. Gather that cyber threat and data and intel. If you're not on good terms with your cyber team, you better start taking them out for maybe drinks in Vegas. No, that'd be too much. <laughs> yeah, that my company wouldn't uh, be cool with that expense report. Uh, the next piece is requesting and analyzing employee and contractor data. Do not forget about your vendors and your contractors that have access to your sensitive information as well. So we're, th we're talking about things like Lo location, title, level, tenure. Those are the different data points that you want to gather that are going to help you identify your persona groups and then narrow them down using the cyber threat intel for your highest risk roles. Network, build relationships. SOC team I mentioned already, HR with the HR data, your learning and development team if you have one at an enterprise level. Uh, leadership here, I think is really important, but I typically see organizations focusing on cyber leadership. They already know cyber is important. You wanna focus on the main level of your business operations that's making the company money. Talk to those executives and to get them to be a proponent of your program and what you're trying to do, because most likely you're gonna target one of their business units for role-based training. So getting them to be a support and advocate and visible and vocal, spreading that message is gonna be super important down the road. The next to last thing here is take an inventory of what you already have today. When you go through that content strategy approach with the build by Frankenstein, you wanna see what can you use? What do you already have? What is dated and needs to be you know, given the boot? And what potential third-party providers are you already working with? or that are out there in the market, pull reports, you know, determine who's kind of the leader uh, in those spaces. 
And lastly, assess your resources and your team. Be honest with yourself to determine, do you have the right resources to make this successful? Historic training programs have been, uh, what are the numbers? I don't know, recently, like 0.5 FTEs for cyber training and awareness, right? Half of a person. Um, modern programs today have a much different skill set. We're seeing folks that have communications, marketing background, uh, learning instructional designers. I spoke to some ladies last night uh, about that, uh, as well as uh, data analytics. And you may already have a team within your organization that is doing data analytics, so you could always you know, make friends with them as well. But really be honest with yourself of do you have the capabilities and the skill sets to uh, actually deliver and run these types of programs. And lastly, remember behavior change and culture transformation is a journey. Thank you. Thank you.